Spirit. So uh, we'll get started. First of all, thank you. And uh, I would like to thank the Davis Center for hosting us and Erin for all the efforts put in making this day happen. So I'm Alain Lau. I'm the director of the AUB Nature Conservation Center and the founding dean of the School of Business at AUB Mediterranean, which is AUB and Path of Cyrus. And just give you a glimpse of what we do at AUB and CC, and then we will dive into conversation today. So the AUB and CC is a transdisciplinary academic research center addressing climate change and nature conservation in the MENA region. We leverage the expertise of and experience of AUB faculty, research staff, and volunteers to tackle the most pressing envi environmental challenges. This year, we are celebrating the 20th of AUB and CC. So I invite you all to visit our website and check the 20 year impact report, which is this one. You can see it and also our 2030 strategic plan and vision. The endeavor to produce research and action, and this is important, not only research, but very, very action oriented, that reflect our outstanding commitment to social and environmental justice. Our collaborations and partnerships are rooted in a shared understanding that multidisciplinarity is key to unlock innovation and make our impact at NCC, we have three key areas of intervention. First, biodiversity conservation. So it's about uh, our approach is one of collaboration, collective action, community heritage, citizenship, and tailored data applications for conser conserving biodiversity. We believe that action-oriented research and conservation initiatives go hand in hand. And our latest projects on this front deal with forest fires in Lebanon, production of high mountains, and regenerative and sustainable tourism. The second pillar we have is environmental stewardship, where we tackle environmental emergencies leading to climate change by developing actions that address air, water, and uh, soil of that related to sustainable entrepreneurship, waste management, and circular economy. Finally, community engagement and community awareness through education and community. Such actions include the an annual EFDA student competition, as well as projects related to citizen science with the communities throughout Lebanon, and panels such as this one. So, which brings us to today's discussion, fostering certainty through green innovation in the MENA region. In the past years, the consequences of environmental degradation and climate change have become increasingly tangible. Climate change knows no borders and its consequences are felt by all, but especially by those living in regions with fragile governance and limited resources. In the face of environmental hazards that are increasing in frequency and intensity, it is crucial that we come together to address these challenges at home. In the past few weeks, New York hosted the 78 UNGA General Assembly. During this event, one of the main focuses was on the high-level political forum on sustainable development and the Climate Ambition Summit. This summit, demonstrated that tangible and ambitions, ambitious actions to cut emissions and deliver climate justice was possible. Open national and international plans and policies with credible and evidence-based targets to accelerate decarbonization, advance climate justice, and a renewed focus on credibility and accountability was needed. So against this, I would say semi-optimist backdrop. The panel today seeks to shed light on the power of collaboration, innovation, and responsible financing to combat the far-reaching impacts of climate change and with a focus on the MENA region. We have three panelists, and I'm really excited to have all of them. They complement very well each other, I believe. 
So first we have Dr. Karol Shushene Sherfe. She directs the Arab Center for Climate Change Policies and leads the Climate Change and Natural Cluster at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESQA. Her work supports intergovernmental processes and interagency partnerships on water, energy, food security, and biodiversity under a changing climate. Carol's 25 years of experience in natural resource management are complemented by studies in developing economics, law, and international environmental policy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Boston, and George Town University in Washington, D.C. And we have also with us today Dr. Ralph Shami, who recently retired from the IMF to work on climate change and biodiversity laws, developing a framework for to build an equitable and nature positive economy. He's the co author, uh, co founder of Blue Green Future and Rebalance Earth. He's an AUB alumnus in biology. Ralph has also an MBA in finance and statistics from the University of Kansas and a PhD in economics from John Hopkins University. And uh, a personal note, if you haven't watched the TED talk that Ralph uh, did, uh, I invite you not now, but after the panel to go watch it. It's really inspiring and gives us hope. And most importantly, uh, he's pushing for a new paradigm. So I believe is needed and we have to open this discussion. Finally, uh, we have Karim Duran. He is a New York based management consultant working on engagements that assess, that assist banks, banking and capital market clients in areas of sustainable finance, climate risk, stress testing, credit and market risk management. So all what is trendy today. He's deeply involved in Oliver Wyman's finance and risk practice, as well as the climate and sustainability platform. He's an AUB alumnus as well in economics and applied mathematics, so a dual degree. Karim has an MS in finance and risk engineering from New York University. So first, uh, we will open uh, the floor to Carol uh, for her presentation on informing action on climate change and biodiversity through enhanced cooperation, capacity, and finance. So, Carol, please. Thank you so much for being with you for this invitation um, and for being with us actually today. I just want to make sure you can see my presentation. OK, is it visible? Oof. OK. Wonderful. Thank you again. For, is it the footnotes? OK. Uh, I'll, I've been invited to give you a little framework about how we think about um, and how we inform climate action in the region within the context of biodiversity and uh, cooperation, capacity and finance. What I'd like to start up with is what I think we already know is that in the MENA region, in the Arab region, we are already the ones that are facing the hottest observed temperatures over the last decades, and we are amongst the driest. What we also know um, is that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been doing important work globally to better understand climate change projections into the future. However, how they have been undertaking their work is by dividing the world into different regions to accommodate um, the ways and the lens through which their researchers uh, have prepared peer-reviewed journals. And I highlight this, especially for this AUB audience, because there's not a lot of literature out there about the MENA and Arab region. And therefore, we have pictures like this, where we are divided and uh, not able to talk collectively. This image shows you a little bit more how the regional analysis presented by the IPCC divides up the MENA region. And for those uh, from a Lebanese uh, context, Lebanon is cut right in the middle. So it's very hard to get information from the IPCC databases. While uh, they are very impressive in scope, they do not uh, allow us to have conversations that think about the Mashrik, the Maghreb, um, the Arab region, et cetera, and allow for policy dialogue and indeed research on our common issues. And that is why we um, have been working with our partners, over a dozen partners for uh, well over a decade, 
on this regional initiative for the assessment of climate change impacts on water resources and socioeconomic vulnerability in the Arab region to better understand what climate change means for us collectively. And we do this again through a range of partners. All the data that I'm going to be sharing with you today is open access, be it on maps, GIS, net CDF files, for you, for you, the researchers, you, the experts, um, the ones who want to promote climate action in the region, you can use this information to do your own types of analysis. And we promote that again through our RICAR um, knowledge hub uh, that you see here. So what type of information do we create to help inform action on climate and biodiversity? Well, we have two products that we've been doing with our partners. One is regional climate projections at the Arab domain level, where you see this larger space that covers all the Arab states, as well as the pressures that come from the Indian Ocean, the head, what happens in the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates, as well as the Nile, so that we get a good sense of what climate change means for the region and its water resources in a holistic approach. That has been done, and we issued a major report in 2017 on this, again, available online. And we were using the state-of-the-art information there um, for making analysis at a 50-kilometer grid size um, scale. However, technology improves, um, uh, capacities improve, and now we have a new set of products for the Mashrek area specifically. You can see that on the uh, other side of the screen, where we have completed now our scenarios at a 10-kilometer scale for, again, two scenarios, as in the other case, but that provides a much more sophisticated, uh, higher resolution output to help not only policy discussion, but also work related to project uh, projectization of policy goals. And in both cases, we're looking at two scenarios, just so that you understand the figures that you'll be seeing right now, the maps. We talk about a, a moderate case scenario and a business as usual scenario, business as usual being those that are not very good on the mitigation and the uh, decarbonization efforts that was just mentioned by Alain, and a more moderate 4.5 scenario that's not very optimistic, but also think, agrees that we are moving forward to um, achieve a reduction in our emissions, uh, be it carbon and other greenhouse gases. So these two scenarios have been used again, Arab region, five, the, the assessment report five scenarios, and now these new scenarios that also incorporate more socioeconomic dimensions um, uh, in the recent IPCC report issued last year, AR6. So what does it look like for our region? Well, we see very explicitly that temperatures have already been increasing. In fact, over the last 20 years alone across the Arab region, average temperature has already increased 0.8 degrees Celsius than just 20 years ago. And we also see that we can go up to even 4.8 degrees Celsius by the end of the century um, if we do not collectively work together to mitigate the effects of climate change on our uh, global ecosystems. So you can see at the moderate, that's the one in yellow on top, how the temperature is increasing up to about two and a half degrees by mid-century and then beyond. And at that business as usual, how much redder, how much redder the um, temperature change is getting to nearly five. And just again, I hope you can, my pointer shows so you understand how to see this. This is a reference period here. And this is in comparison to the reference. So our reference is the beginning of this century, what happens by mid-century, what happens by the end of the century. And you have this information available on a daily time scale to do analysis that you might want also uh, for research on climate in the region. So that's for temperature, but what about the all-encompassing challenge of water scarcity and water security? Well, we also have precipitation coming out of these models showing changes in precipitation trends. And again, this moderate case scenario or the business as usual scenario, which has the higher emissions, you see that there is a drying in certain parts of the region. Again, you see in Northern Africa, around Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria. However, and also drying in parts of um, uh, Eastern Africa, part of the MENA region and the Gulf. But some are actually getting a little bit wetter. And this is also, this is reflective of those extreme climate events, those flash floods we are seeing, where there is a volume that is increasing some places in rainfall, but the intensity and the duration is very limited. So um, it cr creates different signals in the modeling outputs. So while this is being shown to give you a broad scope across the MENA region, 
the outputs are also available at these higher resolution um, outputs for the Mashrik region. And you can see how the quality of the uh, modeling outputs is when you're looking at uh, 10 by 10. For Lebanon, as you all know, we have different topographies. The importance of looking at these different microclimates is much more possible now when we have these this type of finer resolution uh, climate scenarios. So just to give you a taste of these outputs for the business as usual scenario, again, you're seeing a warming from the um, beginning of the century time period that's referenced where we are and getting warmer as we go to mid-century, again, coming up to almost three degrees. And you can use this for different sizes of, of countries and different sub-basins. I've given you an example of how this shows for the UAE, which is hosting the Climate COP, as you know, in November and December. So you can get also a, a better understanding of what's happening in terms of changes in temperature projected in the near term and my, by mid-century. There's different types of indicators that this can also show. For example, um, a very common indicator is the number of hot days. And as the number of hot days increases, this has implications for health, for tourism, for the ability to work outside, uh, how it has to do for agriculture. Um, we see, in fact, that uh, by midterm in the Mashrik region, there'll be three months more of temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, which is significant when you think about the area. And that is not even factoring issues of humidity. Indeed, we see here changes of humidity also happening. And we have to think about that because for human health and what it means for also pollution loads and how we um, can dissipate, for example, all those emissions from the generators that we have in Lebanon when it's humid, the, the it, the particulates sit on our, our um, uh, urban centers and in our lungs, we can see the changes in uh, humidity over time, and that can help us do other types of analysis. One of the most important types of analysis we do is actually linking these outputs into hydrological models, agricultural productivity models, ecosystem models. This, for example, shows changes in um, runoff coming out of the Euphrates River, which we know is a very contentious area in the MENA region and in the Mashrek, with the headwaters coming from Iran and Turkey going into Iraq, Syria, and downstream. So this type of information can help researchers better examine what might be happening in the near term and longer term to better make measures to cooperate and find common solutions. While those are looking at the climate projections, I do want to emphasize the importance of extreme climate events and natural disasters, and we, our hearts go out to the thousands who have been affected by the flash floods in uh, Libya in the last few weeks, not to mention the earthquake in, in Morocco, but in Libya specifically, the idea of these flash floods coming and we are not prepared. Our infrastructure is not prepared for this massive influx and intensity of rain events. And we see here, even historically, the amount, the number of flood events has been increasing over time. But I don't want us to forget also that while the frequency of flooding has increased, that's what you see in red, the number of people affected by natural disasters associated with climate and water is still drought. And we witness this on the effects of drought having to do with um, livelihoods, with health, with displacement. And you could see the increasing um, a number, a number of people affected with, by drought as we go through uh, the last uh, few decades. Despite those challenges related to climate, though, I do want to put the caveat that we live in a difficult region. There's a lot of challenges um, that face uh, the MENA countries. And while natural disasters do contribute to internal and transboundary, you know, internal displacement and migration, conflict still does remain the main cause for displacement. Indeed, you could see here a recent study we did with the IOM and others showing the, the gray is what is caused by climate related disasters but conflict-induced displacement is still the area in blue, blue, and that is still significant. And that is why it is so important not only to think about climate impacts when we're looking at ways forward and solutions, but also at vulnerability. And vulnerability, it doesn't have to do with the biophysical, what the climate is doing to our, our ecosystems. It has to do with our ability to handle those problems. It has to do with our adaptive capacity, be it our knowledge, our technology, access to infrastructure, inst our, the functioning of our institutions, our economic um, welfare, and who are our vulnerable groups. 
All that goes into a conversation of vulnerability, linking awareness, ability, action, and equity so that we can move forward and find those solutions. Because it's not only the environment, but the environment in our, our socioeconomic systems and in our governance systems will, that will allow us to find those um, ways forward collaboratively. So to give you a sense, um, I showed you some temperature maps and rainfall maps, but this is showing water vulnerability across the Arab states um, by the end of the century. And it's a different picture. We see that water vulnerability uh, is, is because of a greater capacity here in uh, Rabat, Algiers, Tunisia. It's not as dramatic vulnerability wise as what we had seen before in terms of the rainfall event. However, they are still vulnerable but the least developed countries who have the less capacity to handle that challenge are obviously in red and we are seeing them to be the more vulnerable countries due to water availability despite the fact that they might be getting a little bit more rainfall same thing when we think of water availability for crops the red showing the vulnerability of the agricultural system and then the more even progressing beyond that, what this means for labor, for people who are employed in the agricultural sector. And again, we see that red all along the southern border of the MENA region and the Arab countries, the least developed countries, and also that orange coming up into Syria, looking into uh, Yemen, looking into Morocco and Algiers, Algeria, how this climate change effect will affect, will impact agriculture employment over the time. So, we are talking about biodiversity. I have some maps we've generated for forestry and wetlands. The scale, because we are looking at the Arab region, is not very high. There's only 5% of our land area in the Arab region that is forested and just 2% that are covered by wetlands. But this shows the importance of local solutions and local analysis, such as what was provided in the Mashrek domain. And that's why I want to show you some work we've just completed in uh, Jordan, where we use these types of assessments and we use the Mashrek domain outputs to conduct vulnerability assessments to see at the governor level and sub governor levels um, what are the vulnerabilities of the different parts of Jordan, and then we can target interventions as we are doing in our climate SDG debt swap uh, initiative program with the government of Jordan in to target the areas that are most vulnerable as shown in red here through mid-century. We do this, of course, in Lebanon, here where we are, um, where I'm sitting at Esqua. Um, we can look at this in terms of showing which parts of the country of uh, the agricultural sector is most sensitive to because of climate um, change impacts. We see here Hezbeya, Beshari, Rashaya in the south being particularly affected and where the other hotspots are. We can see this at a watershed level, um, be it from the, the sea level of uh, Nahar al-Kalb all the way to the snow-capped mountains in the watershed and how the vulnerability changes across these topographic zones, what it means for apple production, what it means for other sensitive sectors. And through that information, we can target and develop projects that have informed investments and not just wish lists that people say something is happening. Well, now we have information that can target and have the timeline for creating those investment opportunities opportunities. Indeed, we've been working with the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of uh, Energy and Water in Lebanon to develop project profiles and concept notes and petition um, donors for projects based on their priority setting and based on this analysis. Indeed, the RECAR outputs I just shared for Lebanon were, was included in the Lebanese fourth national communication and the important issue of wildfires, as mentioned just now by Elan, um, has been used to formulate projects because indeed the protection of forests is one of the favorite issues of Minister uh, Nasser Yassin and he's been advancing projects in this area. How do we do this just to go then go into means of implementation and my colleagues will be looking at this more um, uh, actively, but we look at issues such as institutions and governance, the importance of climate mainstreaming and having sectors connect when we look forward uh, and and to collaborate on the common science base that we were just sharing, how they can have joint initiatives that are integrated and um, project uh, into the future their, their common goals. We look at technology and innovation solutions, capacity building awareness, be it for the public sector, the private sector, or civil society and experts such as yourself, and of course, finance. We can't stop, uh, but of course, uh, as Karim will also mention, and Ralph, um, the importance of climate finance to move this forward. When we talk about climate finance, though, I just want to uh, explain that climate finance, any finance that helps us move forward is good. 
But in the negotiations on climate, there is a differentiation between sustainable finance that might help the sustainable development goals, green finance that has particular goals, and then specifically climate finance, where there is a global commitment that it was not reached and is being renegotiated to mobilize $100 billion a year for climate finance. So these different types of levels of finance have a political dimension, but in the end, any type of climate uh, finance does help us move the way forward if appropriate to our needs. And how we find out of what are the appropriate needs are, thing, are instruments such as nationally determined contributions, where, which are submitted to the UNFCCC and uh, help countries present their commitments on mitigation, but also their goals and activities on adaptation to meet the challenges of climate change. This is a, a detailed PowerPoint, but basically we did an analysis with our colleagues at the UNFCCC and LAS showing what are the major sectors for engagement and water is a priority by far, as well as agriculture, coastal zones, health, energy, waste flows and transport. However, most nearly all the 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 NDCs prioritize adaptation in their requests, but I'm going to just jump back here first. However, while they are asking for funding for adaptation, the flows that come to the region are three times more for mitigation. And that is important because we all have to be part of the, solu the solution to decarbonize and meet uh, and reduce methane emissions and, and support our global goals, but our countries are particularly affected. So we have to have balance between climate finance for adaptation as well as mitigation, especially when the countries are asking for funding for adaptation so significantly. And we see again, a three times um, change. Also, what's important to note, and I'll let my colleagues go into this more, is that the money that has come in is, is grossly insufficient. There's been an ask of 570 billion, but we've only received over the last 10 years less than 35 billion. That sounds like a lot of money, but we're talking about 22 countries, only 11 getting any type of funding, and that is not meeting what they have asked as, as a conditional um, requirement under their NDCs. And furthermore, it's a lot of debt. So we all know the problem of debt now. No, no question about what's happening in Lebanon. So non-concessional debt to, for climate action, that's not going to help us move forward. We need more constructive instruments that allow countries the fiscal space to meet their climate needs as well as uh, mobilize climate action. So with that, let me just jump into, because I'm running a bit long here, um, a couple initiatives. Uh, the ESQA has been working with the League of Arab States, the UNFCCC, other partners to mobilize climate finance in the Arab region. We have an initiative with the ministers of environment. We have a donor uh, climate SDG debt swap that we've been doing with Tunisia and Jordan and inshallah Egypt very soon. We have initiatives that mobilize with the UN climate change high level champions and the COP presidencies efforts to present projects to uh, potential donors that are prioritized by countries. And most recently, we have a water uh, aim climate finance for water effort that links the water action agenda with the climate agenda and brings in uh, multi -develop multilateral development banks and donors together to see how to better target investment for water. Most importantly, though, for you as the audience, as we talk about uh, with the work of the NCC Center and biodiversity, I'd like to just share with you in a minute um, a new multi-stakeholder biodiversity platform that we just lost, launched in July with our partners in Sweden. We are setting up three working groups that will look at nature-based solutions, land degradation and arid agricultural ecosystems and renewable energy. And these working groups will look, work together to generate joint projects on priority issues that ESCO will help um, mobilize resources for after this, these project concepts and project notes are developed through a collaborative approach that involves civil society, private sector, as well as government. There's a lot of measures. Um, this, these notes we prepared for our uh, platform launch in July can be accessed online, and we see that there are many solutions, be it NBS, be it on land degradation and agriculture, 
or renewable energy. And, you know, sometimes we don't think of renewable energy and biodiversity, but it's not only the birds and the wind farms that, that are the problem, but also the mining of critical raw materials and minerals that are being extracted and what that means for habitats and how to uh, also dispose of lithium and the battery packs after. All that, that circular economy approach to biodiversity is also important and we can discuss that more. If you're interested in being part of this, um, we welcome you to express your interest to join these working groups uh, as an institution or even to run it. Our deadline is in a couple of days. That's the link and I'm happy to respond to any other questions you may have. So thank you very much and uh, I'll turn it over back to Alain and I look forward to our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And then see you Thank you a lot, Carlos, for setting that stage. And as you see already expressed interest in this, so we will be, we have a couple of our experts who will be, who will take part in this. So now that the stage is set, I'm going to turn it to uh, a bit. I think there was a lot of interesting things that Carol uh, talked about, but most importantly, I would like to ask you if you can comment on building on this, talk about the intersection, uh, intersectionality between biodiversity preservation, climate change, and environmental degradation. So first of all, I think you know many thanks for the invite and I think Carol's presentation that's uh, that's quite um so let's step back a little bit because most people think about climate. Okay. There is a climate. There's also a loss of nature itself and the loss of biodiversity. And even nature that does exist, that uh, resilience to the climate change. Forest fires in Canada, by the way, they bellowed back up into the atmosphere about eight. So nature itself is now is turning. If we're not careful, it's going to. And absorbing from that. So we of all of this is human activity. Now, if you happen to be in the climate world, you think it's all about emissions. But if you live in the in the nature space, you, it's all about protecting nature, rejuvenating nature. hour, we do not have the luxury of let's let's reduce emissions and then figure it out. No, we have to back to both risks at the same time. So how we do how do we do so? Well the IPCC report that Hollywood was referring to and they are six is very clear. We not only need these are the scientists talking they're saying not only do we need to emissions but we also need to reduce the stock of carbon up in the atmosphere. There's a problem of flow and there's a problem of stock. So think of a tap and a tap. And it's dripping carbon dioxide. It's dripping, I'm being told I should direct. I want to look. Okay. Seems like they cannot hear well if you could speak up a little. Sure. Thank you. So we have a problem of a tap. Tap, think of a tap that is dripping carbon dioxide into a tub that's already full of carbon dioxide. That's what's in the atmosphere. So today, all of the smokestacks in the world were to stop emitting carbon dioxide. We're still going to suffer from the stock of carbon that exists in the atmosphere. But it's not enough to shut off emissions. It's not enough to replace hydrocarbons with solar energy and other alternatives. That's not enough. This is what the scientists are saying. We need to drain the tub. And to drain the tub, we have two options. We can go high tech, which is untried, un, you know, it's a brand new technology. We have no, no experience with it really. And or as my colleague here, Diana, calls it Earth Tech approach. Earth Tech is a technology that's about 4 billion years old. It's really nature. That's where nature based solutions live. It's basically empowering nature to 
help us in fighting climate change. And according to the IPCC reports and number six, nature can do so with about reducing carbon, reducing climate change by about 40%. So we have a plan of action. The plan of action is in, in looking after nature, blue and green fauna and flora, and then nature will boomerang back by helping us reduce climate change by at least 40%. So the plan of action is there. Question is, um, are we doing it? To my mind, I, I think there's a lot of what Brenda said, a lot of blah, blah, blah. Um, since uh, we met, uh, you know, with, I, I recall tracking the price of carbon, it was zero for a very long time. Oh, you could see the price of carbon taking a little bit above zero, then the Paris Agreement, and then you see the price of carbon starting to go up. And so by the Paris Accord, a Paris Agreement, there was all kinds of like, of each other, gave high fives, they sang Kumbaya, and they went and continued to pollute with impunity. Now, the reason for that is because the current economic paradigm, the paradigm that we practice, that I'm guilty of practicing for most of my professional life, which is over 30 years, has a very bad relationship with the living nature, has a very good relationship with the dead nature. An extractive point of view. So if I were to tell you today, what is the value of a salmon? You think I'm talking about the salmon you had for dinner. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what is the value of a salmon frolicking freely in the ocean? That, that is what we are missing. A living nature, which we need in order to fight climate change in the market system, has zero value. If you ask me, give me an example. Look at Whales, we, we know the great whales, for example, is what the science tells us, are, are great allies in the fight against climate change. They enhance fish, fish stocks, they enhance, they enhance the crop stocks, they, they ensure the, the, uh, the health and wealth of the ocean. If today, if great ship were to skewer a beautiful blue whale on its bow and to, and to sail into the harbor, uh, Los Angeles Harbor, what is the penalty for killing a beautiful blue whale? <laughs> Take that whale, chop it into pieces, sell it for meat in countries where they still eat whale meat, and it fetches $40,000. What is the value of a living whale? It's at least $2 million. That's the first paper that we published. It was just to basically say that a living nature is incredibly valuable to us. A nature living is, in that, is, in, is incredibly valuable to us. That's... And the reason this is becoming even more so is because we need a living nature. This is where the value proposition comes in. Now, what I do is I work with countries and indigenous people that are trying to take that concept of a living nature and build a whole economy around a living nature. This is what this is the new paradigm. The new paradigm is saying. In order to sustain our economic and social system, we cannot continue to live outside of nature. The current paradigm believes that the economy is here and nature is here. In fact, I used to teach in academia and we used to call that externality. We do a failure of externality. And I was a professor for many years. <laughs> Whereas in reality, the economy and society lives inside of nature. Everything we do is inside of it. We are a part of nature. When you talk to indigenous people, they see no difference between themselves and, and nature. Nature, they are from nature, and to nature they return. Our system, our economic paradigm, has this belief based on nothing that somehow technology replaces nature, which is a very dangerous assumption, and that nature and that we can grow and where nature can basically, you know, actually worse. If you go back to the work of Bacon and others, the Age of Enlightenment, there's an assumption there in one of his letters. He says, we were endowed with nature with infinite commodities. Lord Calvin says, we, were, we are the master of nature. We should tame nature. So there's these presumptions that somehow nature is infinite. And if you believe something is infinite, that means its price is zero. If you believe something is infinite, that means you can cut, pollute, destroy with impunity. Now, what we're discovering is there's no such thing. Nature is finite. And nature right now is saying, if you want me to help you, you have to help me. If you want to really live sustainably, 
and shared with equity towards nature and to, uh, to the rest of humanity. We are in the 11th hour. We do not have time to build the valley. We have enough science that tells us how valuable this nature is to us, a living nature, which we don't really so part of what I do with colleagues is what the services of a living nature. We started with the whale. It was just to give an idea that a living whale is far more valuable to humanity, so we should protect them. Then we did the elephants, but now we're working on seagrass, mangroves, more salt more. This is part of what our colleague was talking about, the mitigation side. Because if you, when you talk about nature-based solutions, it's not only about trees, by the way. First, in, in, in Canada, we're burning. In, in Greece, they were burning. In Maui, they're burning. In, in, uh, in Tenerife, in Spain, they were burning. Okay. If we lose our forests, we're going to, you know, uh, you know, when you talk to people in the Congo Basin, where I do some work, they'll tell you if we lose the forest cover in the Congo Basin, 200 million people will be on the move. So, you know, climate is adding to our, there's a beautiful chart that conflict in the region, and on top of it is, is climate. These back to each other. And it's just one, you know, one layer of the onion. You, you peel it back, you'll find that the change in climate is, is leading to a set of, set of conflicts. So conflicts within borders, across borders, is going to lead to all kinds of situations. Now, can we fix it? We can certainly try. Certainly try, and we have to, so we don't have a choice. Yeah, yeah sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm being yeah. look yeah. in that direction. Anyway, to make a long story short. Excuse sorry, me, Ralph, it, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, can I ask you to move closer to the mic? Maybe sure. Neil, because the people are having trouble hearing you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, sure. I don't think it's the audio voice, his, the strength of his voice. I think it's the cycle of the repeater, you know, when you're disseminating. So there's something with the connection. We hear him very clearly when he speaks. So if he, he doesn't want to move, that's fine. I think it's the the Too weight late, on your internet late. connection. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. So anyway, so um, so there are issues we, we can, in order to do this, in order to solve this, we need to move away from the silo mentality. Okay, it's, this is not a problem for economists. This is a, a problem that involves everybody. There's, there's a room for public policy. There's room for markets. There's room for, for civil society. There's room for scientists, for academia. This is multidisciplinary approach. And we need that collaboration across all of these silos if we're really going to tackle this problem. But do we have enough evidence? Yes. In fact, the beautiful presentation lays it in front of you. There is no ifs or buts about it. The question is, how do we organize ourselves? Let me stop here because that way. How do we organize ourselves to get on with the business? I like to do so. <laughs> Would we we'll go to Karim and ask him uh, in this case about and Carol touched and you as well uh, importance of financing? Yep. So. Uh, what is it? What is green? And so Carol distinguished a bit between green and climate uh, financing, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the tools, the actor, and what's going on today yeah. on this topic. Happy to do so, and I think Carol did so so eloquently, uh, to say the least, and it's kind of a tough seat to be in coming after Carol and Rob. Um, uh, if you're not into finance, I apologize, uh, just because I'm going to bore you with some technicalities here, but I do want to answer your what what green finance is, what sustainable finance is in a broader spectrum as well. But also, I do want to pause on why um, and how do we get that financing and what what is really where we go from here. Um, so, starting with what sustainable finance is, um, think of it as a process that takes into consideration environmental, social considerations for any lending, investment, or financing activity. Um, environmental considerations could be stuff that Carol hits on uh, climate mitigations, climate adaptation, so investments in uh, renewable power plants, investments in retrofitting infrastructure to combat uh, 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 sea level rise. Uh, but also it could be investments in uh, preserving biodiversity, as, as Ralph has just mentioned. 
And that's the environmental bit. Um, there's the social bit as well. So investing in or kind of tackling inequality, investing in financial inclusiveness, but also supporting community. Probably the worst position when it comes to the climate crisis and, 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 and the nature crisis. So that's the what. Now, um, um, why do we need sustainable finance? Why do we need these products? Um, and, and I'm going to throw a, num a set of numbers here. Uh, feel free to disagree with me. I personally don't fully agree with the numbers, but um, for us to, to, to get to a net zero, uh, 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 economy for the for the whole economy actually to get to a net zero aligned 2015 Paris Agreement economy, uh, the World Economic Forum has estimated that we need around 125 trillion dollars by 2050. Um, I know that's around four trillion dollars a year. Um, other uh, institutions, for instance, Bloomberg and EF, estimated that to be around seven trillion dollars a year. Um, and I know of another consulting firm that I'm not going to mention here. Uh, estimated that to be around nine trillion. So, uh, regardless whether you believe in the four, seven, or nine trillion dollars, I personally think all of them are inaccurate numbers. But directionally, they're telling you one thing: we need trillions of dollars every year to be invested in uh, sustainable causes. Um, now, how do we make sure that these money are being captured? Uh, how do we uh, combat greenwashing, for instance? Any bank now can say, "I have a green bond that is supporting green causes," and then call it today. Um, I would say thanks to the work of the likes of Kernel and Esqua, the, the folks in uh, IFC, for instance, in the World Bank, in UNFI, United Nations Environmental Program, um, um, as well as standard setters such as ICMA, the International Capital Markets Association, uh, climate bond initiatives, um, as well as regulators across different jurisdictions, the EU uh, Commission with the EU taxonomy. Um, and leading financial institutions, we do have principles, we do have definitions in place that are ever evolving. Uh, just to better um, a ring fence, I would say, such financing and that I put into, into the right use. And um, to call a few examples here from the debt uh, capital markets perspective, and there's many markets here, um, you have things like green bonds and loans. So specified use of proceeds going into renewable type of energy investments, going into climate adaptation, so on and so forth. Uh, you have social bonds that invest more into social causes, as I've mentioned. You have things like linked products that not necessarily have a clearly defined use of proceeds, but definitely uh, work with corporations. For instance, let's say a bank A gives company B $100 million, but then again, they, they tell them, Every year, you need to lower your emissions and you need to tag your targets accordingly. And if you do so, I'm going to give you a premium or I'm going to give you a, a discount on your interest rate, i.e. you will pay less for that debt forward. Um, again, that's kind of a couple of examples in the debt market. There's many examples in the equity markets and other type of markets. Um, but where, where do we go from here? Um, how big are these markets? Um, and and Roughly speaking, if you look into public markets, the debt capital markets based on um, the capital bond initiative, we are around $4 trillion, more or less, in total in aggregate. Um, equity markets, based on a, a recent actually, a couple of weeks ago, Morgan Stanley put, put, put the research paper out there from an equity perspective, almost 7 8% of funds are considered sustainable under the SFDR European Commission definitions. Um, that's around another three to four trillion dollars. So we're talking eight trillion dollars globally, right? We're, we're, we're going to talk about MENA in a minute. Um, so we're talking eight trillion dollars, and I've talked about 125, 200, more or less trillion dollars needed. So we're way behind, unfortunately, and more uh, needs to happen. Uh, if you zoom in on on the MENA specifically, if you look into 2019 or 2020 numbers, unfortunately, none existed. We didn't have much financing. It was kind of very low single digit, not less than 1%. But things have been evolving uh, into, into the right direction, slowly but surely. Uh, we're seeing private players such as, for example, W Bank issuing sustainability linked bonds, working with Hard Airways, for instance, and telling them, you need to lower your emissions. We'll give you this bond, we'll give you premiums moving forward for the right causes. Uh, we've seen sovereign wealth funds, for instance, the PIF. Uh, issuing a $5.5 billion green bond 
um, um, last year. Similarly, we're seeing uh, the gov governments like the UAE showing social bonds and whatnot. So definitely we're trending the, the right direction, but as Carol mentioned, uh, that's not enough. And these are debt markets and we have a huge debt issue, unfortunately, in, in, in the region. Um, I'll pause here. We'll talk more about maybe solutions and, and, and patients maybe later on in the discussion, uh, because there's definitely promising VC money going into climate tech, going into these type of startups, and it's actually doing the last few years. So we'll dive back, we'll go back to Carol maybe and go back to the MENA region since uh, um, the MENA at the end. And uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about, you know, the MENA and the Mediterranean context, and especially that we, you know, importantly, often this region as a victim of and always sherry of aid and all of this. But at the same time, you know, we can contribute a lot to, to having solutions. And also uh, maybe like a part of that question would be, what are the priorities nowadays? for that in our region. Well, you know, each of us has our own priorities. The question is under what yardstick. And in the nationally determined contributions that we see um, with the countries presenting what they are prioritizing, we see water agriculture as the priority. And to be frank, when others help with the pre preparation of these NDCs, you know, other agencies, we get a lot more on the mitigation side. So the transport sector and energy efficiency and buildings and um, renewables coming up as uh, areas where they would like more investment and are willing to collaborate on. The challenge is balancing what the expressed needs are with the actual flows that are coming in. And that's what I was trying to say, that it's not balanced. It's so much easier to get private sector engagement and investment in, a, in an energy project that has cost recovery. And again, Karim and Ralph are the experts here. <laughs> but it's much easier to track that funds for mitigation than it is for storm breakers or um, uh, irrigation efficiency or uh, different uh, climate smart agriculture programs, even dams, that's much more difficult to get financing for. I've been recently in calls for the last two weeks with governments trying to help them formulate projects that the climate champions can position for a forum in November, right before the COP. And it's very hard for them to find that cost recovery or the equity stake or the um, way to have a financial package that gets financiers involved in adaptation. And that's the challenge here. We are a water scarce agricultural, I mean, agriculture is not a big share of our GDP, but it is a large share of uh, the value chain uh, that creates employment opportunities across the region from agriculture all the way to the food and beverage industry at, at large. Um, how do we get resources into those that help our socioeconomic development, our, our sustainable development, and achieve our climate goals while also working on that mitigation pathway that we all, again, are committed to move forward, but we have to have a balance. And that is very true in the southern Mediterranean, in the MENA region, explicitly true in the least developed countries in the MENA, who are only getting less than 6% of the flows to the entire region. That's, by the way, globally. Out of just a, a little caveat, the least developed countries in the world who need, who are the most vulnerable are getting less than 6% of climate finance flows from public sources globally and in the region. Something's wrong in that equation when we think about vulnerability and climate impacts and climate action and natural resources not being valued and not being cared about um, and how and we have to collectively work to um, better focus on those needs. Thank you. I hope you could hear me. <laughs> You're on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Asma. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I would be, one of our guests online is saying that we're getting much have, and we continue to have more debt. We need to enforce laws and give businesses the timeline to fix the emissions of CO2. So maybe a uh, uh, you want to comment on this and building on this also and sure what is the role of the private sector maybe in this case right 
So is that back to me? You you broke out a little, or is that to Ralph or Karim? No, it's uh, I went back to Ralph. Ralph. Oh, Ralph. Okay, sorry. So if you think of the nature space, the estimates is we need about a trillion. But let's say you need a trillion dollars. The money that exists right now for looking. Governments are strapped with cash and they have different you know, objectives. Like all the car, put them in money. Want to waste your time? You could cross the dice, stand there, and tell people how nature is important, all this stuff, and we know how well. What's left is the investment mode. Can we, can we make the proposition that if you were to invest in nature, it would be profitable for the for the industry. So this is where I would actually why I retired from because I retired after 25 years of talking to government officials. Decided as the day that we'll just go talk to the industry and see whether we can get the industry interested in this proposition. So I worked with my colleague here and, I and others. We work with indigenous. By the way, although fragile, although they're getting very little of the public sector money or the, what's available, they actually are sitting on tremendous amount of assets that can be uh, used, basically help solve the climate crisis. Meaning there's a demand right now, right? So we're saying we need to fight climate change. That's, that creates a demand. But you, where is the supply going to come from? And nature-based solutions is about in the fight against climate change. So that's the supply side. So it happens that a lot of that nature is in the fragile states, is in the global south, is in these poor countries. So what's left now is can you bring the two together? And does it work? Well, let's take, uh, let's, for example, uh, you know, uh, I let's say, um, I, okay. Bahamas is sitting on 30% of the global seagrass. That is publication in Nature Journal, came out about six months ago. This is science, it says Bahamas, they did a mapping of the floor of the Bahamas, discovered they're sitting on 30% of the global mass of seagrass in the world. Now, why is that important? Because seagrass can capture so much carbon First, basically forest, if you like. Seagrass, if you look at the physiology of seagrass, the seagrass grows exponentially for 50 years. Then at the constant rate forever. So imagine if you had a technology that, that produces for you cash flows at an exponential rate for 50 years, then at the constant rate forever. If you calculate the, the expected present, discounted present value, that would be, the, it would be actually greater than Apple and Google combined. So working with the government of the Bahamas, uh, first meeting with, with the government, I uh, was brought in. He said, well, the scientists discovered this. So you have 93,000 square kilometers of seagrass. You can go up by another 40,000. That 40,000 at a price of $30 per, uh, per ton of carbon dioxide, you're looking at about $150 billion in potential. Imagine. So the so now you have a country that is struggled with that because remember what happened to the Bahamas. Maybe most of you won't remember that they got they got Hurricane uh, Dorian, which decimated the the island and put them in debt, fifty percent of GDP. And you're saying that to the premier. You're saying that to the minister of finance, looking at you, looking for Carol was saying, okay, so mostly debt to finance. Their, their, their needs. And you're saying you are sitting on a natural asset, natu a nature that actually can be an asset. That can enter your balance sheet. That can, will change your net worth. That will change your debt. Will change the whole dynamics of the whole economy. This, this is the space that we work in. But this is the paradigm shift here. Exactly. But who's going to pay for that? Uh, beautiful. So now this is the supply side. 
right? Yeah. Now, who's demanding that? Well, one third of the largest companies in the world have committed to go carbon zero, carbon, carbon neutral. The question is, with what technology are you going to do that? So all these companies that said, we're going to go carbon negative, the question to them is, but how are you going to do that? Because even if you shut off your emissions... You see, uh, beside carbon dioxide, there is neither culprit. That is not a success. Carbon dioxide is responsible for 84%. Other 14% is not a success. Right. right. So let's say the, these, these gases we need to reduce, but they're also up in the atmosphere. We need to... Um, but... For whatever it is, the powers to be, the IPCC reports, and they have decided to focus on carbon dioxide. Start there and see how well we do. I, I would not Excuse me. I was there. In you have to say it louder so uh, that, that okay. people don't mind. And when the God created the sucks, there was two ppm. That one became 300. He said now it's 354. But now I know there is 400 part of it. Correct. That's what we're talking well, about. That's, that's what's in the tub. That's exactly the problem. It's the tub is the problem. And you see, we will need in carbon. Yeah, so the whole carbon is equivalent. Carbon is very good. It's not just the actual. Right. Yeah. So, so then who's going to demand that? So. Negative. So what you can do, you can purchase the carbon of the seagrass of the Bahamas. You do not buy, you do not purchase the seagrass. The underlying remains owned by the by the country or by, so if you're talking about seagrass, salt marsh mangroves or forest, it's the ownership is retained by the country or by the indigenous people or by the local. What you're really selling is the, the carbon equivalent in the carbon service of the forest, in this case, is the seagrass. That's really exactly what's happening. I cannot reveal who's buying from the other side, but the others, the, the buyer's side are saying, okay, I want to I want to reduce my carbon footprint. Can I purchase the carbon of the seagrass of the Bahamas? And the answer is yes. But when you do purchase the carbon of the of the sea, you're not your base, the money has to come back to look after the seagrass in perpetuity. And the money has to come back to look after the local communities in perpetuity. Because it's not just about buying carbon, because what the government has to commit to is looking after the seagrass, because only a living having seagrass can grab carbon. So that maintenance or regrowing will involve monitoring, will involve employment, will, Im will involve a number of things that the government has to commit to do on behalf of the buyer. But so what Microsoft will get will get to say I offset my carbon footprint. But by investing in in seagrass, guess what you get? Seagrass, sea turtles live on seagrass, and tiger sharks live on sea turtles. So you're investing in the biodiversity. And when you have healthy seagrass, you have healthy fish stocks. So that's food security. You have healthy seagrass. We all know when you have healthy seagrass or mangroves, salt marshes, they're great defense against flooding. So you're creating resilience in nature, therefore you're creating resilience in the people. So what does the buyer get? They get the carbon credit, which they can use to, to retire if they like, or if they want, they can actually make money out of it. So it's good. But they also get biodiversity credits, and, and they also get cultural credits, because we're working, for example, with the Maori people of the South Pacific. These are the Maori tribes of New Zealand, Tonga, uh, uh, Islands, uh, Fiji, and French Polynesia, and they are also going to the market with their seagrass, their salt marshes. So now, when when the company, what do you get? You get three things: you get, you get the biodiversity, and you get the cultural credits. So why is that important to Microsoft? Because you still have to make an investment proposition. They can buy those credits, they can sell them, because why? If you look at the futures market, and Kevin knows all about that. Futures market for carbon, the, the future price of carbon is way above $100, much higher. In fact, it's going to be, if we're not careful, it's going to be in the thousands. So you're buying it today at $40, and you know that if I hold on to it, I'm going to actually sell it at a much higher price. But don't worry, 
the indigenous people and the local communities will benefit because all the existing stock gets repriced at the higher price. That's one. But they will also be able to put on their website that I'm investing in nature. I'm getting ESGs. I'm enhancing my ESG scores. I'm getting SDGs 1, 3, 8, 10, 13, 14, 15. So for a sustainability officer at the private corporation, that's incredibly important. One, as the private sector is being asked now by the consumers, by the investors, by the regulators, right? There's a new regulation coming telling all companies, show me your impact. So companies are under tremendous pressure to show that they're good citizens of this world. So we have a market, we have the potential of a market. It's a nascent market. So it has all kinds of issues of gold virtually here and all kinds of this, but this market will mature. And in my opinion, it's going to be the market. It's a new class of assets. And the beauty of it, everybody wins. Local communities will win, nature will win. The, 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 the government, in the case of the Bahamas, gets to has a new source of revenue that is acyclical because it doesn't depend on tourism. It does not depend on, God forbid, there's another COVID or not, because you're talking about a carbon market. It will diversify the economy for them and it will create savings on their on the balance sheet. From the, the from the demand side, I already spoke about it. Nature wins, local community you create, but there I will talk about it later. I'm going to stop here. There are issues that we need to deal with in order to get this market going. Aaron, did you want to? I saw that you put a comment. Would you like to to, to add something? No, I love the seaweed comment and uh, Barbados, uh, you know, uh, there's so many things that are happening globally. So thank you for that, Ralph. I just wanted to say that in the region, um, you were asking about where we are doing mangroves, you know, from uh, Oman and UAE. And we're seeing that increasingly also as a local NBS that, that can address that. So I was just uh, adding that in as there are opportunities here in the MENA region that could be built upon and that are getting a lot of traction. Um, another one was on small scale farmers, but I think that's outside of what uh, Ralph was specifically talking about. Uh, people can see on the note. Thanks. Excellent. Someone is online and has a question. Uh, if it's related to this comment or if not, we leave it till the end. So. Uh, Go ahead, please. I can see. I think it's Samir. It's Samir, yes. Samir, you can mute yourself. We are listening to you. You can. You should unmute yourself. Samir, can you hear us? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, I can hear you properly. Okay. I just want to introduce yourself. Carol. Maybe you can introduce yourself and then ask the question. Yeah, I am. I am uh, Engineer Samir Abu Samra. I'm the president of the Mount Lebanon Alumni Chapter in Lebanon. Um, and I was a council chair for the YUB when it started. And this subject, of course, is uh, the most important in our lives and our communities. In the MENA region, especially, and because I'm Lebanese and I'm counting 51 rivers in Lebanon, starting with the Nahr al Barid in the north of the borders with Syria, coming to Al Wazani River, which is the borders with Israel in the south. And uh, I witness every day, we speak about the resources, climate change, how to reserve our energy. But I see we have lots of theories. I want to go to practical, being an engineer. I have seen all the small, not very much. Every place you go right now, at the end of the summer, where it should be the driest season now, because there's no rain in the last three months. You see the water, what you channels, these small cascades, the small routing, we call them se'i. We see every, you know, Lebanon is sitting on a lake of water at different levels. It could be like in the Dora area at one meter, 
or two meters that or it could be in the mountains at 300 meters or 400 meters wherever you go because of the seepage of the snow that stays on the ground and it goes for the underground water and all of this is kept down and some of them goes on the surface and i feel like crying when i see that look what we all my age i see them flowing in the wrong direction uselessly not taking care of no proper studies are made how to make use of this water not only for the agriculture and for drinking and for for power for any kind of sustainable energy that we need now especially that we have the sun at the right times also and we have beautiful wind in so many areas in lebanon some areas if you go to the mountains they are really all the time tornadoes of wind where are the studies why really we didn't attract attention seriously internationally to some budgets in the world to make use of this not only for lebanon for this five percent you mentioned in the beginning of the discussion that in the mina area it's only five percent of forestry and green areas or whatever so i just ask a question and raise a point where we are ready to help each one of them from his end even if it's a small uh, spot of sand what should we do there are we tackling this question that's really in the heart of these resources problem and thank you very much thank you thank you samir Karov, since you are in the region do you want to take a shot at it sure i'll just be brief look um we observe this right there's a difference between observe temperatures and how we see and then how we can plan forward and that's why we use those climate projections and how the governments are allocating well not only the governments how investors and development banks want to be find ways to uh, invest in climate is that they need the climate rationale for those investments when we talk about climate finance that is why we're using these regional projections that I shared with you and that are openly available and you can do your own analysis at a scale of 10 kilometers. It will cover a lot of areas in Mount Lebanon or Kisarwan or in the north. We use these to do assessments at a national scale, at a regional scale, but also at the watershed scale. And actually we have done work on Nahar al-Kabir specifically on how the climate is projected to affect different agricultural crops and water resource availability in Nahr al-Kabir, both on the Lebanon side and with on the Syrian side, you know, at the it's a transboundary water basin. In Nahr al-Kalb, I showed some highlights in forested areas. And that's what we are doing to help develop projects on wildfires in the Akar and Herman region. And um, we're also using it to inform general policy on providing the climate rationale that there are interventions that are needed on agriculture in certain governance that are more vulnerable. Now, everyone is vulnerable to climate change generally, but you have to prioritize at some point, and that's where the science is being used to help governments and policymakers and funders direct projects um, more specifically. And I want to highlight one experience that has really been noticeable in the last few years as the climate conversation has increased traction in our region. A lot of people have great ideas. There are really a lot of great ideas. We have a lot of concept notes, two pagers, three pagers, four pagers on ideas. We don't have good projects. Ideas are important, but HSBC and the World Bank and uh, ISDB and all these, uh, they need actual projects that are well structured, have the rationales, identify the, the target groups, who are the um, key beneficiaries, how it's going to be financed, what is the work plan. This level of detail that you need to fund a project is not there. And that's what we are working on now because we recognize there's all these ideas out there and energy, but not that projectization that then the then a government like the Ministry of Environment working with agriculture, working with energy and water can then just take a project and say, here, this is what I want. Please come fund me right now. It's a paragraph that says 
we are facing water depletion in our groundwater. Please help me. No one's going to fund a sentence. They'll fund a project. So just a little um, lessons learned on coming together uh, and understanding a bit more how to formulate that as any engineer or business person would know. Um, it has to go from a little bit more specific to go forward. And that's where expertise like those on this call um, can help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Maybe, maybe a quick follow up on that specific point on projects, specifically on founded adaptation, because I know Kevin touched on that point earlier. Um, probably a lot of you have heard of TCFD and T TNFD. Um, TNFD just became a guidance last week in Climate Week. TCFD is the task force for climate related financial disclosures. These are being heavily pushed by jurisdictions in the EU. Here in the US, we do have an SEC proposed rule for every single company of a specific size, whether it's a financial institution or a corporation, to showcase the metrics, their current carbon footprint, and they're going to have to do the same from a nature perspective moving forward from an impact perspective. Now, why am I mentioning this? Um, currently, regulators in the region haven't fully adopted these guidances yet. I know there's proposed rules in the UAE from a TCFD perspective, and also the Saudis are pushing for that as well. Hopefully they, they, they surface out in COP28. But one key exercise that comes from these type of disclosures and reportings is forcing financial institutions and finance seats in the region to perform climate scenario analyses on their own books. So to give an example here, if they have a mortgage book, if they lend money to normal people like all of us to buy a house, they need to assess these mortgages and how exposed are they from a physical risk perspective for all the hazards, the chronic and the acute that Carol kind of touched upon, but also kind of the transition to a low carbon economy. Walking into this building downstairs, I saw uh, this building has a rating C from an energy efficiency perspective. Here in New York, we have ratings. There is a movement here in the US, in Europe, to push towards that and tax people accordingly, and corporations need to be taxed as well. Going back to the voluntary market uh, uh, topic that Ralph mentioned, it's a cycle, right? Once you build these uh, regulatory frameworks, when you ask some of your biggest financiers and banks to align with them, they'll have to go into voluntary carbon markets, purchase these offsets, publish them accordingly, maybe also uh, a jump on a sustainability link bond so that they show, hey, we're hitting these metrics, give us more money, get more funding accordingly. So there's a lot of work also from a right perspective, uh, in, 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 in countries here in the, in, 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 in the region. And I, I do believe it's, it's a cycle. It's, it's, it's not like a one fits all type of situation. Different things need to happen and they, they need to happen simultaneously as well. Yeah, something just picking up on what Karine and Carol just said. If we were to take this to the Middle East, to our, to our region, so can we make a value proposition to investors? Uh, we actually do have a project in Saudi Arabia, and it's mangroves in the Red Sea. And uh, the Saudis are, uh, they've lost a lot of the mangroves, and they're trying to replant, restore the mangrove forest there. And, and so what, what is needed, whether it's for them to decide whether they actually want to do that for their own NDC, or they want to actually go to the markets with it. But if you want to go to the markets, something like that, we could do this in Lebanon, for example. We could. In, in theory, you could reforest all of Lebanon, if you like, and get paid for it. Yes. And by, by the private sector. I'm not talking about government, uh, you know, uh, injections of, of either debt or and make a value proposition, but exactly what Karim and what Carol are saying, what is involved in the project? Like that? What do you have to show, right? So let's theoretically, you'll say, well, we want to reforest. And the first question the, you're going to be asked, do you own that area? That's what I deal with all the time. When people come to me and say, we want to sell our the carbon of mangrove, seagrass, salt marsh, or forest, the first question that private sector, somebody like you, is going to say, well, wait a minute, do you own the asset? In many cases that I find, like in Africa, I've been approached many times, or in the Amazon, where we started to do some work, you get questions from the indigenous people like, can we do this? And the first question is, do you have ownership? Because if you don't have ownership, you cannot put it on your balance sheet. If you cannot put it on your balance sheet, you cannot insure it. The insurers won't come in, the verifiers won't come in, and the industry is going to shy away from it. So the first question is, 
if you have a project, this, I'm building on what Carol beautifully said, which is we have this one pager idea, but the devil is in the details. What are the details? So let's let me be very concrete with you, because that's I do what I do for a living. First question is: Do you own the asset? You have. In the case of the Bahamas, it's very clear. The government gazetted the two laws that says anything that is green or blue belongs to the government. Any, even if you own carbon, the car, the government is the negotiator. So there's no ambiguity from the investment side. I'm dealing with the government now. What they're doing with their seagrass, unlike their mangroves, the seagrass is for sale. The mangroves is for their NDC. You see? So they're very clear that that is for sale. The next thing is, well, okay, let's say, let's, let's take an example, concrete example of Lebanon. So I want to convince Microsoft to invest in the carbon sequestration of the forest in Lebanon. I'm Microsoft, I'm sitting in Seattle. The forest is going to be replanted in Lebanon. Uh, okay, let's say the government is in charge. Okay, so I, I know the entity I'm dealing with. So who's going to verify the verifier? I need an independent body that tells me that the government is living up to its expectations. Because as we saw in Gabon, we had a potential project in Gabon as a coup d'état. Gabon came to its grinding hall. In Zimbabwe, the government raided the carbon project and took all the money. That is not, you know, that is political risk. That is reputational risk from the industry side. So if I'm Microsoft, I don't want to put on my website that I sit in the forest of country X, and then a reporter flies out of New York to that country and says, there is no forest. The money went into the pockets of a corrupt politician, all of the above, that's reputational risk. So, you, so this, we call it asymmetry of information in the language of our economics and finance. You have to solve that issue. So, the, so one is legal, proven, uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, you know, provenance. The second one is, can you? Who's going to verify the verifier? And there are many entities that will come in. For example, we've been approached by PwC. Imagine now, PwC, EY, the, some of the big firms are coming into the market. They're saying we will do the verification. They're replacing Vera, Plan Vivo and gold standard, which really rule the market, they're saying, no, no, these are non-market players. We are market players. We see the potential. AXA, Allianz, others are trying now to come in and ensure the carbon credits. So the market is, is poised to explode, but you need to, to get exactly as Carol said, into the details. When you present the plan, you have to show that you can manage whatever you're saying. And this is where a lot of the failures of the carbon projects or biodiversity projects, they fail at the execution side, right? The concept is good, but then the, question, the first question that you're going to be asked, you're telling me you're going to look at the forest, you're going to replant the forest in Lebanon. How do you guarantee me you're going to do it? How are you going to guarantee me that you're going to look after it? And I need an independent verifier that despite whatever you're telling me, you will tell me, so I'm sitting at Microsoft, I'm in Seattle, I need a dashboard. Basically, that's what we do. I have a dashboard and I see for myself what's happening to the asset independent of what the owner is telling me because there's a more problem. The third issue you have to solve is, well, you're, well, if I'm Microsoft and I'm buying your carbon forward, next five, 10 years, political cycles are short. So, the premier today may be pro-environment, but the next premier may not care, may want to put up a casino or a marina where the seagrass is. That's called time inconsistency, renegotiation proof contracts. I need, I need commitment mechanism. How do you commit that for the next five, 10 years, you're selling me this carbon or biodiversity, that you are going to live up to your word? For that, there's, there's a solution to it. You create a nature trust fund, wealth fund, like we do with sovereign wealth funds that are intergenerational. And therefore you, you, as, you, you assuage the concerns that these, these funds are looking after nature in perpetuity, looking after future, future generations in perpetuity, as well as current generations. So these are issues that no matter what you want to do, are the same issues that going to, you're going to have to face if you want to bring in private money, not philanthropic money, value proposition. 
but that's just because I want to engage with that conversation yes. that is ongoing in that chat. And we have multiple persons who are saying that, and you said it, I'm Microsoft and I want to, not I have to. So, and the main issue here with the people in the chat, they're saying that it has to be mandatory. As long as it's not, there will not be real engagement. What do you, how, what do you respond? Mandatory meaning mandating that Microsoft so laws and policy that okay. come in place to be able to. Okay. And uh, I'm sure my colleagues have you know, views on this too. Oh, right now it's called the voluntary market. Okay. So uh, countries made, uh, remember the Paris Agreement was like an accord, right? A kind of a promise to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And on the back of that, corporations, large corporations, made commitments. But what's happening, there's a buildup of pressure. And, and, and by the consumers, by young people, I mean, my own kid, my son, 23 years old, tell me, reminds me, he said, I'll never work for a corporation that is involved in, in any sort of extractive. I was talking to the the head of recruitment for one of the top uh, companies in London, he's saying we're having difficulty attracting talent to our company because young people are saying, I don't want to work for you. You are financing extractive services. So potential employees, investors, now you talk to a high network. They're telling companies that, or investors, that people manage their money. They say, well, there are companies with ESGs. They say, I don't want to talk about ESGs. I want to talk about SDGs. I want to talk about the next level. Don't tell me about ESG. I want to know exactly what the companies that I'm investing in are actually doing. So, and that's exactly what Karim is saying. Now you have these principles coming on board, raising the bar on everybody, and eventually the regulators will do the catch up. And at some point, it, the regulators are going to say, "You are. It's not enough for you." Remember when I talked about the tap and the tub? Well, if you if you subscribe to that point of view, that means if I tell you I'm going to reduce my emission, that's not enough because who's going to drain the tub? All of us have to drain the tub. So it's going to be. That's my prediction. Maybe we we'll revisit this in a year or so. Companies will be asked, "You need to go carbon negative," because. You need to reduce your emission. Some companies will take them much longer. I mean, if you're an airline industry, you can't fly on water. You, so you have to give them time. But there are other industries that can, can switch with if you give them enough time, but they have to show you a plan of how they're going to wean themselves away from the hydrocarbon. But at the same time, purchase carbon credits. That's how you drain the tub. So perhaps there should be a, a, a policy and let me segue into economics here. Climate is a global public good. Now, we all know, those of us steeped in economics, first of all, for theory of economics says, if you have a public good, you cannot, you cannot expect the private sector to achieve it. Commons. Exactly. So really, what's, what's happening is a dereliction of duty by those in charge. They're leaving it to the markets to figure it out. What we actually need is the steady hand of the policy coming in and saying, this is, in, the climate is a global public good. It's a global public bad. You cannot leave it to say, well, I'll do this, I'll do that. You need the guiding hand. There is where the World Bank can come in, the IMF can come in, the EU can come in, the ECB is, is actually doing good work. Others, you need that. And we did. When I worked on Basel Accord for many, many years for the IMF. Basel was what, what was it about? Well, global banks were competing on reducing their capital. And if you have a bank that has no capital, it's incredibly dangerous to the, to the payment system. So what happened? They got together in Basel in 1987 and they they agreed. Right away they agreed. Of course, they had to agree on what's the definition of capital, what's the minimum, but they agreed that. There, every bank has to have a minimum of this much, and this is the definition, and, these, and then the, the implementation was given to the local authorities to enforce. So how can we agree, can we agree on that? But on the most important, that 
because really our, I mean, this is risk of humanity. We seem to be daily dallying and saying, well, you do it. No, you do it. No, <laughs> you do it. Why are we, why are we wasting time? 20 seconds. It's, it's not only guidances now, as Rath mentioned, it is mandated by a lot of jurisdictions. Um, and for instance, in the European Union, they went from nice to have directional crime scenario analyses for banks, but pushing for capital requirements as well in the European Union. That's, you know, that's not enough. It needs to happen on a global scale, but it is happening. So it's not more, more, mostly like a corporate social responsibility type of activity where you go ahead and buy voluntary carbon. No, no, it's it's being mandated and they have to stick with their own commitments based on regulations, but also based on investors' needs and, and asks as well. Um, and definitely the, the region would benefit from such regulations. Of being, uh, of Young people who don't want to work and uh in these corporations his son who wants to be you know in an organization that is ethical and we know that the mina region has one of the highest ratios of youth so uh, comment a little yeah. bit on this and also the role of education and youth and innovation in this case yeah and maybe innovation is, is the key word here um just quick stats i know we're running over time but if you look into venture capital funding, so venture capital uh, funding is mainly one of the main sources to fund startups out there. Uh, between 2020 and 2022, um, almost 3,000 climate tech startup has been funded with around $120 billion, um, which is a huge number, by the way. Like I know we were talking about trillions, but this market is a very minuscule private market. Now, um, a study that was made actually by, by one of the big four, PwC, they uh, dissected that funding and almost for every dollar spent by VCs into startups, almost 20 to 30 cents are going into climate tech uh, startups. Um, um, did, did some research uh, a few weeks ago just to look into the MENA number. Out of that 120 billion, we have around 6 billion. Not that high, but still impressive. Um, there's around 100 or so climate tech companies in the region. Um, I just ran into one a couple of days ago in Climate Week called Cry uh, Carbon Zipper, which is carbon zero. And what they're trying to do is push an accounting system. Ralph mentioned uh, the big four, the insurance companies. It's a huge market for them. And they're acquiring a lot of these startups because you need to capture, calculate and account for the carbon you're spitting out and eventually have the necessary targets, again, going back to the regulation and what's being mandated. Um, so a message to, 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 to folks at OSB, at other uh, uh, faculties within AUB, and it's not only a business thing, it, it, it hits engineering, it hits every, every discipline, in my opinion. Um, keep an eye on these topics, keep an eye on these startups. There's a lot to be made. I think there's tons of problems to be solved, which is a good medium for startups to start with. Um, and I just gave you an example on carbon accounting. There are tons of them as well. If anyone has any questions online or uh, the audience, and I see that we have at least one hand that it's. I'll uh, give it to Ram. That's Maybe also please uh, present yourself and then uh, go for that question. Jan, please unmute yourself. Mute yourself now, you. Yes. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, I'm Hisham Karame. Uh, I'm a consultant on uh, mainly on waste and sustainable uh, development. Uh, just I want to raise one issue that uh, if uh, and that's from our experience in waste management. If all the initiatives are not correlated and, and the strategy is not well defined and it has one owner, uh, all the initiatives will go into vain. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, donations and uh, loans from international communities for many waste plants in Lebanon. And it's all out of, of the picture, out of the job, because they cannot run the OPEX of it. And because the strategy was not fully studied and it was not fully uh, 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 end, end focused 
and uh, there was no owner of it. And I think we need a lack of, there is a lack of technical controller between the, the donation side and the receptive side, especially that the government is corrupt. Okay, so uh, if the uh, these international communities uh, assign also a technical controller, I know it's becoming bureaucratic, but at least a small technical controller to verify and certify and uh, from the beginning to study the strategy because money really we invested tons of money in Lebanon to uh, vague and I have one uh, more point corporates are running the world right now and they are the biggest uh, pollution uh, producers so uh, it's okay this is the development this is the world this is how growth will go but at least if we uh, uh, weigh the initiatives of all of these corporates into their uh, and and their their uh, 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 their initiative of donating money as part of their corporate governance as part of their social responsibility program to give back to the community but all of this need to be fully studied and correlated all the initiative together and we should weigh these the uh, the 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 weight of each pollution or each polluter on the international pollution on the uh, 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 green emissions. This is my point. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank and you. it was really a great discussion. Thank you, Hisham. And personally, I follow a lot the recycling industry in Lebanon, and I, you know, I have studies on this, and I know the industry, and I echo what you're saying. It's it's lots of micro initiatives with no vision and lots of financing that went into them with little impact. So yes, there, as you were mentioning, there's a lot of uh, money going into startups, but the impact of this money and how much it is, you know, uh, in, in the case of Lebanon and the recycling industry, at least I know that a lot has been wasted. So countries is an issue. Nature is a long cycle. Political cycles are short. And so this, this idea uh, is not just in Lebanon, but in many other countries that I work in, I always have to skirt the diplomatic talking to the government that uh, despite your commitment, you have a short political cycle, um, whereas we're looking after nature. So, so but are, there are ways, they're more costly, of course, to get around. But they need the funding. The condition is if you want to get the money, are the conditions. And, and you set them in a way that they're not easily uh, renegotiated. For example, when I talked about the Nature Trust Fund, so the Minister of Finance in one country said, This money is ours. I said, Yes, sir, the money, the value of the asset will come. The balance sheet is, is a stock concept. So that, that asset comes on you on the asset side, it will change your net. And that's care about because it's going to reduce that for you. It will change your debt dynamics and your ratings, of course. Right? But it's the flow that comes out of that trust. The governance of that flow does not. I am in it, so I can tell you exactly how we negotiate the money. It, you will have to agree to this, that the governance of the, of the dis, dis, I mean, how you dispense from the investment of the trust fund, it sits outside your country. You will have a representation on it. But for example, if you if you committed to Microsoft, I'm just using Microsoft as an example, that the money will go to look after the, the salt marshes or the mangroves, right? That governance of that one is not with you. It's a body that looks after that. You may you may go, that money is secured outside. Same thing if you've committed that the money is going to go to create local development projects for the, for the population, same thing. Now, when we work with indigenous communities, we don't face any of that. So when, in the South Pacific with the Mari people, it's run by the Mari for the Mari. It's managed by the Mari folk. And they think internationally, you don't have to explain any of that to them. They and nature are one. They, they think in long term, they have equity towards, they 
Nature to them is a living system. So you don't have to worry about these types of mechanisms. So there are ways that you, it's most costly, and if the cost is too much, the contract does not have it. But there are ways. Of it. I want to segue back just to something that you asked, Karim. The development is incredibly important. This is where you come in also, right? As the NCC, as, as an educator, young people about this incredible that the paradigm that they may have grown up in is not the paradigm of the future. That's where I see AUB and other institutions. And I know you guys are already just, I'm supporting that call, which is this idea that you, you bring the, the young people into, let's say the business school, and I, I taught in business schools for many years. I was guilty of just focusing on you know the bottom line <laughs> at the expense of nature. At the expense of a living and at the expense of this plan, really, I'm guilty of it. So, but you know, there's a room for atonement, and this is what I see what I'm doing, right? <laughs> is is atoning for my sins, and part of it is to to give the youth that look, you can still make money, but by looking after nature, how wonderful is that? You look after nature, nature looks after you. Make money, but in a sustainable way, in a shared way, in an inclusive way. And the paradigm of the loop, you know, zero one or uh, win lose proposition is doesn't have to happen. It's something we fell into, and we're trying to get ourselves out of while we still have time. Stop here. So one or two last quick questions before uh, wrapping up. Uh, Rami, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm Rami Khouri. I'm a uh, a journalist. Uh, I have a, a very small technical question uh, to Carol. Uh, we should anticipate three more months of 30 degrees plus. Uh, uh, centigrade average temperatures in the years ahead. Was that another three months or a total of three months? Now we should anticipate the little the mean of the Mashrik region. I'm sorry, the first part we couldn't hear well. Could you just repeat it? I heard something about three months. You I'm mentioned not sure what in, your, in your initial talk that we would uh, should anticipate three months more of 30 degrees plus or just a total of three months? No, the um, there's an there's indicator that has to do with the number of hot days over a year and the, right. the number of hot days. There's another indicator that's consecutive dry days, but I'm just talking the total number of hot days over and hot days being measured as over 35 degrees. By the way, that's what we use in the MENA. The world talks about over 25 degrees as being hot. Obviously, it does that doesn't make sense for us over here. So number of hot days above 35 degrees, it will reach um, three months more on average for the Mashrek by mid-century. Three months. That's significant. Okay. I thought it was three months above what we already experienced yes. now. No, exactly. Three months more. So we're... Uh, I have to pull up the graphic. We're around uh, 200 days or something like this on average, and we'll increase. And, uh, your presentation is online on, uh, on your site? If you go to ricard.org, all the data, all the visualizations, all the excerpts um, are there. I'm happy. I've already shared my presentation in a PDF with uh, our colleagues there, and um, they're welcome to distribute it if they like. But you can use Thanks. the data and extract the data that you'd like from that ricard.org website. And again, I, I give thanks to the partners also. This is not all my work. It's the 12 organizations, especially the Swedish government, that's been helping us um, generate these outputs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My other quick question, which is... So first of all, I'm so happy to hear, I'm so, I'm so happy to hear Ralph Atone for his uh, uh, misbehavior. <laughs> I spent uh, the last 50 years as a journalist and an academic IMF, NGOs, UN, governments, all the civil society, private sector. Um, and the main conclusion that I reach uh, is that not just in climate change, but you look at every sector in society, health, 
transport, uh, water, any, if you get any society across the Arab region, uh, we have a collective, sustained, and ongoing inability of a criteria that actually benefit the public well being. Now, we know this is a reality, and, and we have to try to uh, change it somehow. And you're offering here an incredible option of uh, private investments coming to save, uh, to save the day. My question is, any of you have examples of Uh, do you have any examples? They governments behave in passionate, effective way on behalf of the well-being of their people. Because I, I see very, very few. There's pockets of excellence here and there, but nothing on a sustained level. That strikes me as the big, big challenge, and it's beyond the scope of this talk. But Thanks for what you're doing. Okay, so um, Saudi Arabia, there's an incredible, incredible uh, project, number of projects underway, and especially in the Red Sea. I mean, I could direct really quite something to be proud of. And we are we just have a we're part of a sliver of it, which is the mangroves forest that they have. The, for example, do you know that 2%, the, the forest coverage in Saudi is almost 2%. I didn't know that. I had no idea. 2%, I mean, it's incredible. And they have an incredibly ambitious project where there it's mangroves and seagrass and, and other, and I can direct you. It's not an issue of government commitment. The government is committed. There's no ifs or buts. But in other countries where, and I, I fully, uh, I'm, you know, I worked at the fund. I wrote a book on fragile states, so I, I'm, I'm aware of these issues. I think if you approach the government, okay, so that since I'm now free from that, I know I can speak freely. Um, governments in the Middle East, for the most part, look at everything from the prism of security. That's the prism through which they see the whole world, where you and I may be looking at it from other prisms. Uh, they and look at it from prison of security. So, but ultimately they need the funding for whatever they need to do. So the idea from here, in, in, when you present to them, as I've done not in the Middle East, but in other countries where I have similar experiences, is to say, your nature right now is you're looking at it as nature and you're destroying it because you think by building a marina rather than having my, it's generate revenue for you. But here's a proposition for you. If you leave that seagrass as is, you'll make more money. And you will be called an environmentalist. So you, you, you'll get a medal. Now, I don't know, you know, I, I don't care what in people's hearts, no one really knows. I care about your actions. So here's a proposition for you. Leave that seagrass alone. You'll make more money. Ultimately, that's what they care about. So on your fiscal side, you 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 got extremely well. But by leaving it alone, by leaving it alone, also you generate food security, you generate employment. So although maybe in your heart you really not, don't really care, but you're gonna look like observation equivalent as if you care. Ultimately, what you're really doing, you're bringing them into a new world, kicking and screaming with the idea that of revenue, in the hopes that. They atone, that's like me. That they become converts into the idea that a sustainable nature is good for them. By the way, and it's really good for their people. <laughs> and and everybody then is on board. I think we're out of yeah. time. But at this point, uh, do we have one last question? Yes. Uh, so, Roni, we'll go with the last question from Roni, then we will wrap up. Um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you for this initiative. And uh, I, I do appreciate uh, the debate about changing paradigm. I think it's extremely important 
for a country in such a dire situation in Lebanon as to look outside the box. Uh, I'm, I'm the, you know, I'm Roni Karam, I'm the president of the Lebanese Foundation for Renewable Energy. Uh, and this is what we've been pushing for the past four or five years, not only install more renewables, as we hear sometimes, and we've seen the market picking up substantially in the past two years, but changing the paradigm, you know, promoting a new energy model for the country. Um, concretely, you know, and this is, uh, you know, rebounding on Carol's comment about not having very specific projects. I mean, we've worked, you know, we started working with AUB, IFI on policy notes and, and uh, you know, energy mixes and, and how we can leapfrog into in a renewable energy model. But uh, today we have very specific projects. We work very closely with villages. Uh, you, know, you know, we work with uh, 25 villages in al bakl Hermil. We're working now with 12, 11 villages in Shouf and villages in, in uh, Mount Lebanon in the south on very specific projects for water or for hybrid systems for the villages. And I think, uh, you know, um, I don't agree on the fact that there are not enough projects. We presented a lot of these projects to the World Bank and to international institutions, and they know about very specific projects that only need today financing. Same thing for hospitals. You know, we work with this and, and now with Hotel Dieu, and not, I mean, they're going to install uh, renewable energy solar on their rooftop, but created a microgrid where you also install solar on solar panels on the rooftop of neighboring schools that gives free energy for schools and give the excess energy for uh, for uh, hospitals, same thing for water wells, etc. So I think uh, you know we we need we need to dig more. I think international institutions need to work with local communities more, because the projects are here. Uh, we see much more awareness from from uh, mayors and from uh, hospitals than we see it from the central government, and we all know it. And I think it's important to be able to collaborate together in order for you, for us to show you at least in the specific field that we work on, very specific projects ready to be financed. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone. So I'm gonna just uh, once again, thank you all for attending. Uh, Aaron, I want to thank you and the Data Center for organizing this and facilitating it. Carol, uh, uh, thank you a lot for being with us. Just a small, I know that you have it, so now you can give it to your co-founder. This is a small gift to both of you, and Carol, you'll get it as well. And for the others, this is a promotion for NCC fundraising uh, to buy the Trace of Lebanon book. So, and uh, a treaty that comes with it. So Antoine will see you tomorrow, Carol, I think he's going to give it to you. <laughs> and uh, Finally, I, I will leave it to uh, me, uh, to uh, the chair of uh, UB Advisory Board, Dr. Karim Pure, just to do a wrap up in four or five minutes. And uh, again, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Nadine Pure. Uh, I'm the partner in crime of uh, some of the people on uh, uh, ending uh, remotely. For Salah and his team on NCC. I'm going to just uh, try and uh, not summarize, but uh, highlight a. I think everyone uh, said uh, things that contribute to how do we act on uh, what we know already or on what we need to know a bit more. Come three uh, points. Uh, one, uh, in a way, I've been following both the last week and what was happening at the uh, assembly and the SDG uh, summit. And without being too bureaucratic about it, I just want to say where the world is going and why it resonates with a lot of what was said uh, today. For those of you who were keeping track, you will see that a lot of it is going to resonate with some of your partners in the region and with us. And in talking about us, I have to be to humbly say that the model of this uh, particular uh, it gives me much to then go back to my own board and 
our board, the board of advisory uh, to uh, NCC. We have people in finance, we have people in industry, and we have people in, uh, in out of those really huge meetings we are meeting in New York, not by chance, but because we are trying to apply some of what was because um, there is a, a general uh, agreement, but the uh, Secretary General of the of the UN uh, said would be four ways by which the SDGs can still make it uh, on time. That we are very much uh, behind the program of implementation. One is to recommit to the SDGs. We are not going to change them. We are not going to downgrade them. To recommit and deliver. Now, how do you deliver? You first focus on poverty and inequality. That I think that uh, Karim has mentioned the need to focus on as a, a uh, potential uh, priority. Uh, this was discussed a lot is the idea of an SDG stimulus that people were throwing billions and trillions around. They uh, assess it at the UN as being 500 billion per year of a stimulus of additional things just to implement the SDGs. And we discussed here how it's not all going to come from donations and the private sector investments have it. Really, really. Fourth is the national institutions and accountability. That, uh, by talking about the importance of capacity building and others have institutions, but also of the private sector. Accountability, we discussed a lot, the, the need for that at the public uh, level and the private. Just to give a global framework to what has been discussed. Uh, personally, and this I, I come to my. I, uh, I usually assess uh, if a uh, panel or a workshop is uh, successful by knowing that I learned uh, at least five things uh, new. And today I learned a lot more than five things. Just to go very quickly as what is actionable. I learned from Carol that although we knew that MENA usually has updates and by God, splitting a small country like Lebanon in two for the database. <laughs> Certainly, that was an eye opener. But what I learned that really was was very encouraging is uh, the the level of data and detailed data that you have, and the possibility of uh, institutions like NCC and other to build on it. I learned a lot, of course, more than this. But for time, I will. Uh, just mentioned one or two from Ranf, of course, it's this whole idea of a new paradigm and uh, focusing on nature, even as a way of addressing very specifically change. And the whole issue of new paradigm, of course, is, is a, a, an important one. It doesn't remove from the fact that we still have the same SDGs, but it gives a bit more hope of uh, this time getting it right for the second half of uh, time that we have. A lot of what we said brought me back to uh, the meeting. Climate week and the whole financing, there's a, a, a lot more that we could have said <laughs> that I think uh, CC will have to to well uh, on, which is really how to get into the accountability thing that the UN talked about, so that no one is greenwashing, no one is doing uh, any uh, just uh, rounding of the corners, but that we are uh, 
that uh, the whether private or public sector, we are uh, addressing uh, issues that are uh, ultimately making a difference on the ground. Uh, finally, then uh, for NCC, uh, my impression is that oh, and also I learned a lot from interventions, uh, the three interventions from the participants about the importance of what is happening or not happening in uh, Lebanon. Uh, finally, for for NCC, I think whoever talks about paradigm shift then needs to have uh, research, uh, monitoring, modeling, uh, piloting. And uh, I think you, you've all had a rich agenda for NCC to uh, the solution in a multi uh, sectoral, multi discipline. And the, this allows me to finally thank. Uh, I mean, of the efforts and uh, thank you for inviting for, for more action with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>